Britt Marling, you are the co-creator, showrunner, writer, actress, craft services. You do everything on the <laughs> OA. Um, I want to go straight to basics. Uh, and for people who are watching this, um, if you've seen the show, wonderful. If you haven't, maybe you might want to come back later because I don't want to. We're, we're going to probably be talking about spoilers for episode. Uh, for, sorry, for season one. I would like to know why did you want to tell this particular story with your um, collaborator Zalbert Manglich? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think it was a couple of different things came in. I think we were really interested in talking about the power of storytelling. Um, I think that's a subject that's been on our minds for a long time, especially in our earlier films that we've made together, Sound of My Voice and The East. Um, I think also we were particularly interested in talking about teenage boys. Um, we spent some time before we started writing in the Midwest um, doing kind of anthropology research of, of sorts, you know, traveling to high schools and meeting kids and talking to teachers and going home with them and figuring out where the teenage mind is right now and what they're feeling and thinking. Um, and it felt a little bit like those kids feel like they're in need of a new kind of narrative. And um, I think we started to sort of dream up the idea of this girl who's had this extraordinary experience uh, and has sort of lived to tell the tale coming back to this town that she grew up in and sort of at first seeming very off-putting, but then these boys are sort of drawn into her story. And the, the more they listen, the more their their imaginations are opened and they're sort of, you know, putting their smartphones away and they're, they're taken into sort of another realm with her. Um, and I think th th that was all sort of the early seeds of it, was the idea of the power of storytelling to kind of create a tribalism between people who might not otherwise spend time together. Yeah, and you guys wrote it and developed it and then Netflix, which you've talked about this before, but it took a really huge gamble by premiering it with very little to no fanfare at all. I mean, yeah. talk us through that decision. That would have been quite scary. Yeah, you know, it was, but I also think, I think everyone inside Netflix and, and uh, everyone who was part of the core group that made this thing, and we really made it in a very handmade way, you know, it's Zal and I do a lot of this stuff between the two of us and it just it has the feeling of being a kind of small tribe and I think everybody invested in it felt like oh we want to protect this thing it's such a delicious pleasure to come to the narrative not knowing anything because part of the leaps in its imagination or where it takes you as a, as a story is is about not knowing what's coming next and so everybody at Netflix was really on board for that and they actually came up with the strategy they were like well to protect the integrity of the mystery and how fun it is to be inside it. What if we just really don't give the audience anything and let them come to it on their own um, as a kind of great mystery box? And I think that they were really right in doing that. I think it was the right thing for the show. And I think it allowed it allowed the audience to come to it and sort of champion it and, and be like, wow, this is unusual or this is different or this is what I think it is. It's sci-fi, no, it's coming of age. And all these sort of discussions online about what it means to tell a narrative that breaks a lot of rules um, it felt like they they wanted to protect that. So I was really moved that that they came up with that idea and that it it seems to have worked, you know. Yeah, it was so completely appropriate um, yeah. because the OA really subverts expectations, defies classification. Like I, It's so hard to explain, as I was saying to you offline before we started recording, it's really difficult to explain what this show in a nutshell is about. You can give a, you know, a synopsis of how it begins, but... For me, I started watching it thinking, okay, it's really interesting about a woman who was blind, she's come back, fantastic. And then it just pivots to the Russia storyline and then it just becomes this other thing which then, you know, made me completely devoutly hooked. What, what, um, what fan reactions are you most predominantly getting from people about what, once mm -hmm. they've seen it, what do they most want to talk about with you? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think a lot of people, there are a lot of theories about you know, what happened in the story she was telling? Was it the truth, you know, detail for detail? Was it a metaphor for a darker, more complicated truth? Um, was it completely fabricated? I think it's, you know, the, the first part by design is, is supposed to leave you sort of engaged in that mystery and, and wondering. Um, and it's just interesting to see what side people fall on. You know, I think there are 
some people who are skeptics by nature and they want to believe that something extraordinary or magical or something that they cannot describe in science as it stands now happens in the end. Um, but they're not sure, you know, especially once the sort of faith in her story is punctured. And then there are other people who tend to be naturally believers, you know, and, and for them, or romantics or, you know, poets. And for them, I think immediately they see the ending and they take the leap of faith and they're like, I don't care that the, the story was punctured or that there maybe some doubt was cast. The definition of faith is that you believe in spite of doubt, I believe, you know? So it's interesting to just see um, those two camps and also the people who are in between. I think it's kind of beautifully revealing about human nature, you know, and the, the places we're willing to let our guard down and, and where we put it up. And, um, and also it's exciting for us because the story was always conceived to be much longer, you know, Zal and I spent a good year and a half just thinking about this mystery, this mind bender mystery and plotting all the sort of twists and turns in the labyrinth and what would be at the center when you arrived there. And so we sort of think of it like an accordion with all these pleats in it. You know, the story has a beginning, which we saw in part one and an end, and the pleats are kind of like all these tentpole moments that could be stretched out possibly for, you know, many years or condensed depending on on what happens, but there's definitely a lot more story to tell. So we were happy to kind of leave the audience in a place of wonderment at the end rather than stitching it all up, you know? Yeah, and see the gamble was that the show might not have been picked up for season two. It could have been a complete yes. disaster. And yes. so the, I, I'm, I assume that you guys are making a conscious attempt to balance telling a standalone story about this person and also setting up this ongoing mythology that we are now all obsessing about. <laughs> <laughs> that's really that's really beautifully said it's it's so true I've never heard someone articulate it so quite so cleanly it's like we're taking our own leap of faith in telling the story right like we don't know it could be that we get to tell one more part it could be that we get to tell two three four you know who knows but you do have to try to construct something that feels like it has integrity in and of itself you know almost like it's like a book, you know, it's like a book with a beginning, middle and end. And then like you're adding like another book and then like yeah. a third book, you know, yeah. and it's like you, you want it to feel like it's a delicious novel that when you get to the end of it, it meant something, it had something to say and it left you with something. And you'd love to get the next book if it comes out. But if it doesn't, you would have been, you would have felt like it was a worthwhile reading experience, I guess. Yeah, and that's that is the dilemma that you have as creators to make sure that you're you're covering both fields. Thankfully, you don't have that problem anymore because you you are coming back for season two, and we'll go there later. Um, yes. And you know, I I realized as I was watching it, and then I started looking online that there's so much detail that you have added to the show that you would never have normally even noticed if you're just watching it very superficially. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say that's a fair assessment, that, that there's a whole bunch of things in there that if we watch it very carefully, we will, we'll pick up on later on? Yeah. Oh, I think that's really true. Um, there's all kinds of things happening with color, color palette, um, in the design. Alex DiGiorlando was a production designer, and he's someone Zal and I have worked with before and is an amazing storyteller and an incredible artist. And... Um, he really comes in as the production designer and continues authoring the story with us. So there's all kinds of things he's doing inside design, inside the costumes that's happening. Um, and I think that I think there's something sort of by design in the story, it has a kind of elliptical nature. It's like you get to the end of eight and a, kind of the, the feeling I think some of the audience has, oh, I gotta go, go back and watch one again. And then they just keep going because they realize on the second viewing that they have a completely different understanding of it. And, and also that the sort of, um, her story is kind of the roadmap she left for the boys, you know, as to, um, as to what happened. And so I think people feel like they can come over it with a kind of um, forensics, you know, to look for, for other clues to the mystery. And they're definitely there. I mean, people find, some of the things that I, I have seen come up on Reddit below my mind. I mean, yeah. people are just getting so good at, at, at cracking the mysteries and, and using all the resources of the internet to solve, you know, problem solve together, which is really beautiful. Yeah. 
Absolutely. You know, there's um there's a whole bunch of through lines in this series. One of them for me and for many, obviously, is that this is a meditation on the after effects of trauma um, and how people rationalize things in order to move forward. So, for example, um, it seems clear that Prairie connected with Homer in that experience that she's retelling to the boys and and the um, character played by Phyllis. Um, so that storytelling and that connection with people is how some people do get through trauma. Would you say that you looked at PTSD sufferers or how did you get to that point where you really wanted to bring that out of the series? It's really, it's really beautiful to hear you say that because I haven't heard many people talk about that. Um, I don't know. I think in this country, trauma is something we kind of tend to avoid or brush under the carpet or we want a series of clear, like, self-help steps through it, you know? Um, but there, but we are a sort of traumatized people in a lot of ways, you know? And I think, um, I think that there's something very powerful in the fact that this girl comes back and wherever she's come from, it's clear that she's some kind of victim, you know? She's in shock and is experiencing, as you're saying, genuine PTSD and she's so afraid and vulnerable that she can't even be touched. And I think, storytelling or, or, or just learning to find language to put that trauma into words and share it with others is a beginning of a kind of healing. And I think the unexpected thing that happens is her story is so true and so honest in so many ways to those boys that they end up finding healing for themselves in it as well. It's, it's almost as if a lot of what she describes about captivity feels for them like a closer truth a closer approximation to the truth of what they're feeling inside their own lives, like their school and the narrowness of, you know, how the narrowness, the new narrowness of like whatever it is that you're supposed to dream about or what your ambitions are supposed to be, the town that they live in, their parents, all of it feels like a kind of captivity, you know, even the captivity of gender and gender conformity or race and, um, and you feel that they feel boxed in in this way and that along with this girl, they're trying to figure out how to break out of their own captivity. And that's why her story is so meaningful. And, and they really do, you know, even though they lose faith in, in her in some way or the group is disbanded, but let's just say, you feel that by the end of it, some, some kernel of truth inside her story stayed with them. And it, it allows them to face their own moment of trauma armed, armed or prepared in a way that they may not have been otherwise. Yeah. And us as the audience, we're also going through a journey personally with Prairie, who is yeah. sharing her experience with us. So it's deep. Like, let's, let's just go, let's just say that it's deep. Um, so <laughs> my question as well uh, is about NDEs, because that's another gateway into this series. That's something that I say to people, if you're really interested in that, you might like this. Did you do a lot of research or preparation in respect of that particular topic? Yeah, because um, those stories are so fascinating. I don't know if you've read anything about it, but it's like we, had, we, we met a girl who had an NDE, and that was the first part. That was many years ago. That was maybe even a decade ago, honestly. Um, I met a girl who had a near-death experience, and I was so moved by how she operated in the world. She just seemed to have like a different understanding of what she was doing here and why like like she had just had a glimpse behind the emerald curtain and like reality meant something different to her and i remember being enchanted by this woman and how she behaved and later on when we started to tell this story we started really doing research and you know started reading raymond moody's work who uh, he wrote life after life which is sort of he kind of coined the term near-death experience uh Sam Parnia is someone who's been studying it more recently. And what's interesting is it began as a total fringe science. You know, people are like, is this really even a, is this a fair place to be pursuing science? And then slowly it sort of becomes something that is considered in the mainstream, like a valid area of research. And, um, and of course in our story, we take it to an extreme because um, HAP is actually pushing people to, you know, into near-death experiences to try to study them. But uh, a lot of people who've seen the show who have had near-death experiences say that it has a kind of uncanny ability to 
give the viewer the sense of what that experience is actually like the feeling of leaving your body the tunnel like approach to this you know bright light and then to be surrounded in, by a space where you know the rules of physics and everything just change and you feel a sense of wonderment or awe that is hard to later articulate in words so yeah absolutely speaking more about how you put the show together um there's a lot of discussion on on many different series about cast diversity, this this cast in particular, um, you know, it takes from you know older, younger, non-binary, male, female. It, I think it looks like you guys have made an effort to find um, different faces that we don't normally necessarily see on television. I'm wondering what it was the most difficult um, uh, person to cast on this show. Oh, what a good question! You know, the truth is they were all really hard because. I've done other things before where I felt in casting, you're like, wow, any one of these three actors could bring something really great and different to the role. And it would be three different versions of the film, but all three would be compelling. This was not like that at all. This was like, you just had to find Steve Winchell. And if you cast someone a little bit to the right or left of who he was, the whole story falls apart. Like if he's too much of a bully and he's too aggressive, then you don't care to follow him. He's gotta have something inside him that feels vulnerable and in pain that makes you feel like it's worth, it's worth being inside his character even though he's gonna punch some kid in the throat hmm. because there's something about Steve that's worth fighting for, you know, that he's like a soul that's hanging in the balance and which way is he gonna tip? And, um, and the same is true of, you know, Buck Vu, who um, we wrote as a, um, transgender Asian American teen. And I remember A.B. Kaufman, our casting director, who's brilliant. At first she was like, I don't know if we're gonna be able to necessarily find the actor you want with all these specifications. And, and then she put something out on the internet. And I, mean, I think this is the power of the internet now, is it just spread everywhere. And all of a sudden, all these amazing reads were coming in, just kids in their bedroom, doing cold readings, uploading the video. And, and that's how we found Ian Alexander. And he's an amazing actor. And he'd made the video on his iPhone in his bathroom, unbeknownst to his parents, and uploaded it online. And then we just like called and we're like, hey, we want to cast your son in, in this Netflix show. Are you down? Um, and we had a Skype with the family and stuff. But yeah, A.B. A.B. Kaufman worked really hard. We worked really hard and we tried to be vigilant to make sure that the that we were finding, we were finding um the right people to tell this particular story. And we just got really lucky, I think. Everybody in the cast is brilliant. Phyllis, mm. I mean, Phyllis Smith, it's like. Love her. She might be an actual angel, I, yeah. I think, you know. Yeah, yeah and uh, we're used to seeing Phyllis in, you know, the office and in comedic roles and to see her in something like this. At first, in fact, I, I was in trying to be skeptical and you always want to be slightly skeptical and removed, but there's something about her, isn't there, that just draws you in. There's an honesty about her face, about her, the way she plays that particular character. Completely. You know, um, Zal, uh, who directed All Eight Hours, obviously, he had seen her in Bad Teacher. And he, I hadn't seen that movie, but when he brought up her name, I was like, oh, my goodness, she's the voice of sadness from, yeah. I can't remember, the animated movie. Inside and Out, yeah. Inside Out, she's brilliant. I mean, the the honesty and the truth in that performance and also this sense of humor, it's like I, she held it together. So yeah, she's brilliant in this. And I think you're right, we're seeing a different side of her that we haven't seen before, which is really compelling. Mm. And obviously speaking of the cast, many people want to talk to you ab about your role as creator, writer, but you were the lead as well. Um, and so you're putting on different hats when you are about to play this character. This isn't something that I would expect to be so easy to do. You're playing blind, not blind, traumatized, <laughs> you're telling a story. Like what, what would you say was the most challenging aspect of playing Prairie? Oh gosh. Um, I think part of it was that I felt, uh, I think we knew in the writing that it's very challenging to come in with a character who's mysterious. Um, usually you're looking at the victim from another point of view, you know, so you're with the detective or you're, you're with 
somebody else and you're watching the strange girl come into town you're usually not with the strange girl under the blanket as like she's reacting to coming home and so i think in the beginning we thought wow this is challenging just in the writing to try to how do you connect with or suture with this girl even though you have to withhold the story of what's happened to her for so long um but i think we tried to just find the the moments where even though you don't quite know what's happening everybody can imagine what it feels like to come into their childhood bedroom and look at that bed for the first time and like in many years and wonder what it, you know, and then get in it again and, and be back in that childhood space, even though so much has happened so much that you you can't even communicate yet. That sort of gulf that can open between you and your parents or you and your former self. Um, so we try, I tried to lean into that, but I think, I think also honestly, the thing that was the most helpful in terms of finding, her ultimately was the training of learning to do the movements because that required i just had to move in a way i'd never moved before and they are surprisingly hard to do not because i mean they look easier than they are but when you sit down and try to train them they're moving your body in like awkward ways or you know the thing that would hurt the most after training was like your throat muscle because there was this gesture where you snap your head back and so we were all walking around with these, like you know, <laughs> holding our necks, you know. Because um, so, I think there's something. Usually, for me, I come to the character from a, the psychology, you know, from feeling. But I think there were some things with Prairie slash the OA where it it was actually about embodying it first, about movement, about spending entire days under a blindfold. You know, I I would go around New York with um, a friend of mine, Joe Stretchy, who's blind. He's been blind since he was 19. And we would, he taught me how to cane through the streets of Manhattan and how to make an omelet and how to clean my apartment. And I would do, I'd spend a whole day under a blindfold with him. And that just changes how you think, how you feel, how, you know, through how you move. And um, all that stuff was really helpful with her. Yeah. You know, the movement especially is so important to this show. If someone had told me that there's a show where people use movement and artistic expression to get together and kind of do something. I'd be like, yeah, that doesn't sound quite like my cup of tea, but it's totally <laughs> and utterly, either. yeah, you know what I mean? I'm, but I'm not yeah. saying it very elegantly, but um, for people who aren't aware, it, you know, there are a lot of really amazing, intricate, um, interpretive dance type movement things that the characters do together um to become this like this powerful expression i guess that's how what i'm trying to say what yeah. what do you get from people on the street or in you know when you're talking about the show are people generally just wanting to talk about how the movements came to be or what what do people want to talk about when when they want to talk about the movements that's interesting i mean i think some people some people want to know about like, well, can you just teach them to me <laughs> because I want to learn how to do them. That's what I hear the most often. Um, and we see videos all the time. People will send in videos of like a group of people doing it in Paris or a group of people doing it in the Netherlands. And, and they're beautiful and they're amazing. And you realize that one of the unfortunate side effects of technology, you know, is that we're all kind of, we're connected more than ever, but we're also disconnected. You know, we, tech allows you to kind of keep a barrier up. You don't really have to be vulnerable or in real time with somebody. And, and also everything about it is kind of living from here up, you know, it's like we're all up in our brains. Um, and something about the movements is this invitation to like drop down into the rest of your body and to remember that you're an animal, you know, and that you, that your body has a kind of intelligence that, is in some ways maybe even more advanced than the intelligence of your mind, um, your rational linear thinking, that, that maybe the intuition that your body holds is equally important or feeling, deep feeling. Um, so I think there's something about the, the movements that really struck a lot of people as this kind of like, ah, I want that. Like, I, don't know what, I don't know what that is. I want that. I don't know what it means. I don't know how to talk about it with other people. I'm almost even embarrassed that I, want yeah. that but i want that you know yeah. and um and i get it because i i felt the same thing even training to do them you know like in the beginning when emory cohen who plays homer you know he and i would show up for the first rounds of practice and we just met each other and we're moving in these weird ways and you know hissing at each yeah. other and stuff and you're just sort of like 
this is a strange way to meet, <laughs> you know. Um, but then it reached this really transcendent place where we started to be able to communicate to, to each other through that body language, and it was moving. It was just very moving. Um, so yeah, I think there is something inside that that leaves um, leaves the realm of what is knowable or what is what we can easily capture in words and becomes kind of cinematic, just truly cinematic expression. It's hard to describe, but when you watch it, you feel something. You do. And I think the payoff was obviously in the finale when in the cafeteria, the five, well, they're, they're looking at each other and they're using those movements to fend off this really horrible thing that's happening. And then unfortunately, the OA is shot, the glass cracks in five places. It's very, very beautifully done. What was your mm -hmm. reaction when you finally saw the finished product? I love that you noticed that it cracked in five times. Oh, I've seen it a few times. So. Uh, that's really beautiful. Those are the kind of details that you think nobody will ever notice. You're just like, oh, this is this fun thing that we're doing. Anyway, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question even? Like, I got stuck on the I detail. Mean, you're in it, you're directing it, or Zal's directing it, you wrote it. Like, so you're very familiar with what you're trying to achieve, but when you yeah. finally saw it on the screen, did uh, it live up to your expectations and what was your initial reaction? Um, the first time I saw, well, I'll just talk first about the, the moment on set that day when we shot it. I think we were all very um, worried, you know, because we were building up to this moment of total word wordlessness and either it works or it doesn't work. And but those boys had trained so hard in those movements for six months. There's no special tricks of editing. There's no visual effects. It is literally just five, four teenage boys and their algebra teacher standing up in a room and moving in a way in perfect synchronicity that no one has ever seen before. When they did it the first day, the first time, all the 250 um, background actors who were there, who were the other students, the look on their faces was like, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, awe, horror, revulsion, confusion, like tears, people crying, joy. I mean, the whole gamut. And, and some people, a whole roller coaster of emotions at once. Um, and I think when we saw that, we were like, ah, oh, there's something inside this that's powerful. But it wasn't until I saw the rough cut, um, Jonathan Alberts had done the first sort of an amazing editor and he'd done the first sort of string out of that ending and Zal and I sat with him and Matt Hannum and the four of us watched it together uh, and it it just it had something inside it and I don't know what that is because I think filmmaking is this funny endeavor it is the riskiest game in town because you write the script and it's a blueprint, but you've no idea if you're going to be able to build the house or if you, when you build the house, it'll be a nice house to be inside. And you're gathering all these people together and you're just hoping that at some moment the whole endeavor transcends the sum of its parts. But you've no idea if that's going to happen. And I think in that moment, for some reason, for me, it did. You know, Rostam's score... Um, Rossi and Bob Monglich, who did the original score that's the violin theme music that's over everything, that score comes in and the look in Patty Gibson, who plays Steve Winchell, that look in his eyes when he decides, makes the decision to stand and put himself in harm's way and Ryan Heffington's choreography of those movements and Zoll's direction and it's like everything just comes together and and has and it, and it has something inside it. It may not whether it's for you or not for you doesn't doesn't really matter. You know, it's it's achieved something in its own right. And so, yeah, I think in that moment when I saw the rough cut, I was like, okay, we've got a lot of work to do on these eight hours, but there's an ending. You know, the ending means something. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Tell us why, I mean, this could be an obvious answer, but Braille is very important to the story. I, I noticed mm -hmm. it on Katun's face and it's in the FBI office and it's on Prairie's yeah. Russian dad. And I've, I've been trying to figure out where else I might have seen it. Obviously, Prairie was blind. Is that really it? Is that the only reason why you wanted to use Braille in the story? Or is there more to it than that? There's definitely more to it than that. I can't say because I think it would. Um, but there are things coming in part two that will 
answer a lot of those questions potentially. But even just out, even outside of the mystery, I think what's so what's so interesting about Braille, and I tried to learn a little bit of Braille as I was studying what it's like to live without sight or to lose your sight. Um, it's you know, it, it, you have to become sensitive in a different way. Like your fingers become your eyes and navigating the world that way is, is just a completely different thing. So I think the braille in there is kind of an invitation to remember that there are, there are a lot of different ways of communicating or speaking, you know, braille, movement, you know, song. I think that the, the show has all these elements in which like, there isn't just one way to get the story out, if that makes sense. Like there are a lot of different, a lot of different ways to communicate. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So a couple of um, specific questions and I'll let you go. Um, so Riz Ahmed's character, I found him baffling and I'm still trying to work out what his motivations are. So I think he planted those books. I know you're not going to tell us why or how or what, um, but are we going to learn more about that particular storyline and him in season two? I can't, I can't say, but I can say that it is a worthy thing to have asked a question about. Okay. That's good. You're pleading the yeah. <laughs> Um And secondly, the season ends so ambiguously. The OA appears to be in some room and she's staring right at the camera and she's saying Homer and we're yeah. looking right at her and then it kind of ends and then we all kind of go back to the beginning and watch it again. Um, you're not going to tell me anything I know, but is that is there more to that? Are we is that where the show will pick up from? Maybe. Um, I can say that it's that ending was very deliberate in the sense that we had already done. I guess you could call it. We'd already cracked the Rubik's cube and the mathematics for what would happen in the next part existed before we ever started writing the first chapter of part one. So we have to wait a while <laughs> to get those answers, but they're all coming. Okay, and okay. hopefully you can tell me if it was worth the wait or not. I will tell you that. Okay. And finally, can you give us, can you give Gold Derby, lovely, good old Gold Derby, something that you haven't told anyone else yet? Or are we just going to have to wait? Um, it's a scoop. <laughs> I'm putting the pressure on you now. Uh, I'm just trying to think of what what I can actually say that isn't. Uh... Well, I can say this. I can say that her story, the story that she tells in part one, really is a kind of roadmap. And the most careful observers of that story will find a lot of things in it that will tell you where the narrative is going next. Fascinating. <laughs> Britt Marling, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank and, you. and congratulations on a wonderful show. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to talk.